Honors Biology Midterm Review. You can access this review and this video at srhsbio.wikispaces.com. First questions are about systems. Compare the strategies used by a plant and a non-human animal. So there were several choices. You could choose digestion, excretion, movement, transport, gas exchange, reproduction, or control. So I picked transport, and I'm going to compare a vascular plant and a crayfish. For the vascular plant, organs include roots, stems, and leaves, which are all made from vascular tissue. Two types of vascular tissue are the xylem and the phloem. These contain strands of cells that are stacked on top of each other end to end, which act like pipes. The phloem specifically carries sugars, whereas the xylem carries water and minerals. Transpiration is the evaporation of water from the leaves. So as water is evaporated, it gets pulled up the plant. This helps move water from the roots all the way up to the leaves. Crayfish have open circulatory systems, so the blood vessels are performing similar functions to the vascular tissues in plants. Uh, it has a heart composed of muscle with valves that separate chambers. This prevents the mixing of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood and makes the circulatory system more efficient. The heart pumps blood, whereas plants will rely on transpiration to move liquids. And the blood carries food, gases, waste products to the tissues of the crayfish. So since this is an open circulatory system, it means that the blood is not always contained in blood vessels. Next question asks us to select two human organs that are part of the human body system, analyze their structure and function, explain how they differ in cellular makeup, and how these organisms help to maintain homeostasis. So a heart in a human has four chambers that are separated by valves. Again, this helps to prevent the mixing of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood, making the organ function more efficiently. And the heart pumps oxygen-rich blood from the capillaries near the lungs to cells, and then it pumps the oxygen-poor blood to the lungs. This is where oxygen diffuses into the blood. Uh, the heart is going to be made of muscle cells, and these muscle cells are going to have lots and lots of mitochondria, higher than we would see in other uh, human body cells. This is to prevent fatigue, as the heart always needs to be pumping, always needs to be moving. This helps to maintain homeostasis by ensuring that all cells are getting the oxygen and nutrients needed to undergo cellular respiration. The human lung, we have two lungs. There is one on each side of the heart, and this allows gas exchange across moist membranes. So as we inhale air, that air can diffuse across those moist membranes in our lungs into our blood vessels. So this works with the heart to maintain oxygen levels in the blood. The lung is a series of smaller and smaller tubes that eventually end with air sacs, and this is all semi-permeable membranes that allow gas exchange. There is also a high surface area. The more surfaces that you have to allow gas exchange, the more efficient gas exchange will be. The lung ensures that all cells get the oxygen needed to undergo cellular respiration. It also removes the wastes of cellular respiration, which is carbon dioxide. So we inhale air that contains uh, oxygen, and we exhale carbon dioxide. Next question is about single-celled movements. So here we have three different single-celled organisms. So this first organism has this long whip-like tail. So this long whip-like tail here is called a flagella. So this organism spins that tail around and uses that to kind of paddle itself around in whatever environment it lives in. Cilia, so all around the outside of this organism, we have these hair-like 
or structures. So these structures all beat in one direction, kind of like one of those biking boats that you see where everybody grabs an oar and they all paddle in one direction. The cilia function similarly. And this organism here is using a pseudopoda. So what this organism does is it takes part of the cell, part of itself, and it extends it and then drags itself along that extension. So that is a pseudopoda, which means fake foot. The next question asks you to match the description to the word of the different roles of body systems. So some of these words we're going to use more than once. So transport food and water between roots and leaves. That is going to be the function of vascular tissue in plants. Synthesis of hormones. That is the endocrine system. The endocrine system makes the hormones. And then to transport those hormones from the glands where they are made to the body tissues, we're going to use the circulatory system. Transmit, transmit impulses. That is the job of a neurotransmitter. Regulate body temperature, that is also a function of the circulatory system. Whenever we get hot, our blood vessels dilate and they are closer to the skin, which allows that heat exchange between our skin and the environment, helping to cool us down. Deliver oxygen, that's also the role of the circulatory system. Transport nutrients and water, again, circulatory system. Whenever we are trying to regulate glucose concentration in the blood, that is an example of regulation. So usually there's some kind of feedback mechanism which has our body measuring how much glucose we have and telling our body whether or not we need to break down glycogen to make glucose or if we need to store glucose as glycogen. Moving metabolic waste like urea, that is the role of the excretory system. So urea is an example of a nitrogenous waste. This occurs in all organisms from the breaking down of amino acids. So we make these nitrogenous wastes, could be urea, could be uric acid, could be ammonia, uh, but one way or another, those wastes need to leave the organism. All organisms use the cell membrane to remove waste. So the cell membrane is the ultimate gatekeeper of the body and that all cells have a cell membrane and that all waste must pass through that cell membrane. In a multicellular organism, after the waste pass the cell membrane, they might go into another system like the excretory system, but one way or another, waste is produced in all cells and needs to exit the cell membrane in all cells. Jumping when touching a hot surface. So that is a reaction to a stimulus. So the stimulus is the hot surface. When you touch that, that message is sent between neurotransmitters to your motor neurons, and that causes you to jump back. The nervous system sends sensations such as pain. So uh, if you were to, say, go to the dentist and have surgery done, uh, they would have to give you some Novocaine, something that numbs up and prevents that nervous system from sending those messages. Nerve control and chemical control, those are both forms of regulation. The next questions are about cell structure and function. So first question provides us with a diagram of a cell, and this is simplified. There's a few things that are missing. For example, there's no nucleus, there's no endoplasmic reticulum. We've just kind of simplified this. So label the following, phospholipid. So here I have a phospholipid that I've grabbed from the cell membrane and I've kind of blown up so we can see it a bit better. The phospholipid is made of a phosphate head, and a lipid tail. Proteins found in the cell membrane. There's three in this picture. These are different proteins which may have different functions. They could be something like an aquaporon whose job it is is to help water enter the cell. Uh, there are membranes to, there are proteins to allow certain types of nutrients in that are too big to cross the cell membrane, but these proteins serve a bunch of different purposes. Some of them are involved in cell-to-cell -cell recognition, uh, but there are many different types of protein and they are embedded in this phospholipid bilayer. 
the mitochondria. So these kind of look like little kidney beans. And they've got all these folds inside. This is where the cell will extract energy from sugars. The cell wall, that's this big dark line. Usually whenever a cell has a cell wall, it's kind of um, square in shape. It has a regular shape as opposed to a cell that only has a cell membrane that can be kind of many different shapes. The chloroplasts are of course green because of the pigments inside of them that absorb light. This is where plant cells absorb light and use that energy in order to create sugars. And the cell membrane, of course, is made of the phospholipids. The next one, is this a plant cell or an animal cell? So this is a plant cell, and we know that it is a plant cell because one, it has a cell wall, and two, it has chloroplasts. Those are cellular structures that are unique to plant cells. Next one, why is the phosphate head attracted to water? So this picture here is actually a picture of a phospholipid, and we can see all of the different atoms. So these long fatty acid chains here, those would be the lipid tails, okay? And the rest of this, all of these parts together, that is what makes up the head, the phosphate head. So first thing I want to point out is that the phosphate head has charges. Because it has charges, we say that it is polar. Both water and the phosphate head are polar, so they attract. And we summarize this with like dissolves like. So this is why oil and water don't mix, because water is polar and oil is nonpolar. Because both the phosphate head and water are polar, they dissolve in each other. So we say that that is like dissolves like. Polar dissolves polar. What is the purpose of the mitochondria? So again, there's the mitochondria. The purpose of this is to use energy from organic compounds, sugars, in order to make ATP. So whenever plants first make sugars, they use sunlight in order to generate ATP and use that ATP and store that energy in sugars. Then later on, perhaps there isn't sunlight available or the plant needs a lot of energy. It can then break down the sugars and use that to regenerate ATP. ATP is like a rechargeable battery that the cell uses for energy and it can recharge it by breaking down sugars or from using energy from the sun in the case of plants. Differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So pro, if you're a pro at something, you've been around it a long time. So this is the very primitive, simple cell. A eukaryote, you sounds like new. So these are going to be more modern cells and they're going to have membrane bound organelles. So this is the important part here. So since we have these organelles, we have the mitochondria and we have the chloroplast, they're all membrane bound, which means that this cell is going to be a eukaryotic cell. How does the cell membrane help to maintain homeostasis? So again, the cell membrane is the ultimate gatekeeper for the cell. This regulates what enters and what exits the cell. And more importantly, it ensures that the right amount of chemicals and food and other required nutrients are present in the cell in the correct amount. So that cell membrane is very important for providing all of the raw materials in order for that cell to maintain homeostasis. How does the cell wall prevent this cell from bursting when it absorbs water? So again, this is a plant cell. As the cell fills up with water, the cell membrane pushes up against the cell wall and the cell wall is rigid. So this prevents too much water from entering the cell because eventually that cell membrane is pushing up against the sides of that cell wall and no more water can enter. It's kind of like if you took a water balloon and put it inside of a plastic container. Eventually, there would be a point at which you couldn't add any more water to that water balloon because it would be pushing against the sides of your container. The cell wall is very rigid and helps it to hold its shape. So it prevents the cell from bursting. Next questions are about lab practices. 
So what is bias data? A uh, bias data happens when the experimenter has some kind of preconceived idea of what the results of an experiment should be. Or it could be due to data that unfairly favors one result. This is due to a flaw in the design of an experiment. So the best way to avoid this is just to be honest and open-minded in the design of your experiment. So for example, let's say that there is a company that is doing a drug trial for a hair growth drug. If the patient taking the drug knows that it's supposed to make hair grow, they might report that their hair is growing simply because they expect it to happen. So this is also called the placebo effect. So if you tell a patient that a certain drug is supposed to do something and then give them a placebo, they might say that the drug is being effective even though you just gave them a sugar pill, just a placebo. Next question. Uh, a single cell is eight micrometers across and I want to know how many millimeters this is. So the way that we're going to solve this problem is using dimensional analysis. What that means is that we are going to use the dimensions or the units of the number given to us to solve this problem. So we know that this cell is 8 micrometers. And I want to change this into millimeters. So. That means I got to get rid of the units of micrometers. So the way we do that is we are going to divide by micrometers. So if I do micrometers divided by micrometers, it's going to cancel out. So the unit that I want is millimeters. So if I do 8 micrometers divide by micrometers, while well, multiplying by millimeters, that's going to give me units of millimeters. So in order to solve this, I know that one millimeter is a thousand micrometers. So that means that I just have to do eight times one, that's still eight, divided by a thousand is going to give me millimeters. So in this case, eight divided by a thousand gives us that many millimeters. Next question asks about an experiment. A student wishes to determine the effect of fertilizer on the growth rate of a plant. He places a rough amount of soil into 10 pots and places a seed in each pot. He places half of the plants in a windowsill before he runs out of space. He then places the rest of the plants on the floor beneath the windowsill. He then fertilizes the plants on the fur with SuperGrow and the ones in the window with super green fertilizer. So, one of the problems with this experiment is that he put a rough amount of soil into the pots. So, how would this affect the experiment? So, this could provide different amounts of soil nutrients to plants. So, basically, what we're doing is we want to see how fertilizer affects growth rate. But if we start off with different amounts of nutrients to begin with, I don't know for certain that the reason one fertilizer grew better than the other was only because of the fertilizer, because there's another variable, the amount of soil. This could also help the plant absorb more water, which means that we would affect the growth of the plant. So ideally, we would like for each pot to have an equal amount of soil. Is this a controlled experiment? Explain. So this experiment is not controlled. How do I know that either fertilizer is better than no fertilizer? I have no way of knowing that. So the control is a trial in which the independent variable plays no role. So we see that we've got two experimental groups, one with SuperGrow and one with SuperGreen fertilizer, but we have no trial in which there is no fertilizer. So what could be a possible control? Again, this is where the independent variable plays no role. So I need five plants that don't have any fertilizer. How can we improve this experiment? The main problem is that we have too many variables here. We have amount of soil as a variable, 
we have the fertilizer as a variable. And since half of the plants are in a window and the other aren't are on the floor, then the amount of light is another variable. So we need to remove these variables. We need to put all of the plants in the same condition. So I need the same amount of soil in each plant. I need the same amount of light for each plant. That way I know that the only reason one plant grew better than another plant is because of the fertilizer. What data could the student collect to answer his question? So he needs to measure the growth of the plants. There's a few ways that we can do this. We can measure plant height. We can measure number of leaves, uh, number of flowers. We could also do mass. So there's a few different ways that we can measure the growth of these plants. Next set of questions are asking us about macromolecules. So first question, why does ice float? So over here on the left, you see that we have liquid water. Those little yellow dotted lines represent hydrogen bonds. So these hydrogen bonds are constantly breaking and reforming, and hydrogen bonds are of a certain length. So while the hydrogen bonds exist, they're holding the water molecules a certain distance. Because these hydrogen bonds are constantly breaking, the water molecules are being held close together as a liquid. As a solid, whenever this water cools down, these hydrogen bonds stay in place, and this holds the water molecules apart from each other. So if you look at the picture on the left and on the right, you can see that the ice is less dense than water, so it floats. Next question about macromolecules. So the monomer for carbohydrates is going to be monosaccharides. Proteins, the monomer is amino acids. For lipids, fatty acids. There's also a glycerol that we can include in this, but in general, fatty acids. Nucleic acids, their monomer is nucleotides. And for vitamins, we don't really worry about it. So for nucleic acids, there's adenine, thiamine, guanine, and cytosine. That's for DNA. And for RNA, we have adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine. So there's no T in RNA. Let's look at the role in the cell for each of these macromolecules. So carbohydrates are the main energy source. So through cellular respiration, sugars, carbohydrates, are broken down to release energy. That energy is used to generate ATP. Proteins, many enzymes are made of proteins, and these exist for very specific tasks. Proteins do all kinds of stuff around the cell. So there's a protein to let water into the cell. There's a protein to uh, break down other proteins. All of these are roles of proteins. Lipids are an important part of the cell membrane. They can also be used in some organisms as long-term energy storage. Nucleic acids transmit genetic information. And vitamins are precursors for important molecules. They're also coenzymes. So, for example, vitamin A is the precursor for retinol. And retinol is very important for eye health and function. Next, we need to match the macromolecule with its function. So the enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide in cells is called catalase. The big hint there is that it ends with ACE, so that tells us that it's probably an enzyme. Bone health, that's vitamin D. Blood clotting is vitamin K. The starch that is the main component of the cell wall, that is cellulose. And that ends with OSE, which is a big clue that we're dealing with a sugar. Wound healing, that is the job of vitamin C. The next section asks us to focus on proteins specifically by looking at enzymes. So why does a cell only need a certain number of enzymes to complete many chemical reactions? So here we have a cycle of the life of an enzyme. So we see that the substrate first enters the active site of the enzyme. Then the substrate can be broken down by the enzyme and converted into products. 
the products are released and now the active site is available again for substrates to enter. So enzymes can be used over and over. That's why this is a cycle. So one enzyme molecule might be reused hundreds and hundreds of times until eventually the cell replaces it. So enzyme temperature and function. So what is the optimum temperature for this enzyme to function? So if we look carefully, we see that the top of the activity the rate of the enzyme action occurs around 35 degrees Celsius. So to summarize the information on the graph, the temperature affects the relative rate of enzyme action, working best at around 40 or 35 degrees Celsius. Why does the enzyme activity drop off suddenly after 40? So, once we get past 40, we're at pretty high temperatures. Room temperature is around 25 degrees Celsius, so we're way above room temperature. This high temperature causes the shape of the enzyme to change, and the fancy science word for that is denature. So this enzyme is denatured, the reactants don't fit inside anymore. Remember, an enzyme is like the lock, and the substrate, whatever it's acting on, is like the key. And if those shapes don't match, that enzyme can't do its job. Next question. Uh, pepsin is an enzyme found in the stomach. Draw a graph showing its activity over a range of pH levels. So the stomach is pretty acidic. It's at a pH of about 2 and most of the enzyme's activity will be at the enzyme's home pH, which is at a pH of 2. So because this enzyme is found in an acidic environment, we expect for it to work the best in an acidic environment. So here we see that we have the highest activity at a pH of 2. Next set of questions are about diffusion and osmosis. So draw a picture showing molecules that have just begun to move across the membrane. Then draw another picture showing the same molecules once equilibrium has occurred. What drives this process? So here we have a picture where movement has just begun. So we're going to see that most of the molecules are going to move from A to B. And we might see a couple moving from B to A, but the net direction is going to be towards B. Once equilibrium has occurred, they don't stop moving across the membrane, it's just that they move equally in each direction. So they don't stop moving, it's just that there is no longer a net flow. So if a molecule goes from A to B, another molecule goes from B to A in equal parts. This is driven by diffusion, and this is due to the differences in concentration. So whenever movement has just begun, we see that we have a very high concentration gradient. The amount of particles in A and B is a very big difference. So this drives the diffusion process. Next question. Students place a concentrated sugar solution in a dialysis tube and seal it up. Then they place the dialysis tube in a beaker of distilled water. Draw a picture showing what happens when the bag is placed in the distilled water, including the direction of water flow. So, here we see that whenever we start, the bag weighs 50 grams and there are 250 milliliters of liquid in the beaker. After 24 hours, we see that there is less liquid in the beaker and the mass of the bag has increased. So, here's a beaker and this represents distilled water. And inside, there is my dialysis tube, and those little stars represent sugar molecules. So here we see that there is really a big concentration gradient here. There's lots and lots of sugar inside of the membrane and none on the outside. Now this membrane doesn't allow sugar to pass in and out. So the only way that this can achieve equilibrium, equal concentrations inside and out, is by water flowing into the dialysis tube. So that's why we see that the mass increases. It's because of this concentration gradient, water has to flow inside of the 
dialysis tube in order to achieve equilibrium. So why does the dialysis tubing get heavier? Sugar can't pass through the semi-permeable membrane, but water can. So in order to achieve equilibrium, water has to enter the tube. And as more and more water enters the tube, it gets heavier. A cell lives in 10% salt water. So which solution would be hypertonic? So hyper is greater than. So hypertonic would be the 20% salt solution. Hypotonic, hypo means less than, so that would be the 5% salt. Iso means same as, so that would be the 10% salt. So the next couple of questions ask which would cause the cell to swell and to shrink. So let's put a 10% salt water cell in each of these beakers and think about how this would happen. So in this example, salt cannot pass the cell membrane of our cell. So the only thing that can move is water. So we can kind of think of, since this is 20% salt, we can think of it as being 80% water, which means that our cell is like 90% water. So if we think about it, water should move from high to low, so it should move from 90 to 80. So in this case, the cell is going to lose water. This one is isotonic, which means just as much flows in as flows out. And in this case, we can think of this as being 95% water, 5% salt. This is 90% salt, 10% uh, salt, 90% water. So we think of water as going from high to low, so water will enter the cell, causing it to swell. So the 5% salt solution, water is going to enter the cell, making it get larger. And in the 20% salt solution, water will exit the cell, causing it to shrink. Next set of questions are about photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So uses CO2 and H2O to make sugars. That would be photosynthesis. Uh, chemical energy is converted into a usable form. That would be respiration. So this chemical energy is in the form of glucose. Producing glucose, that is the job of both photosynthesis and chemiosynthesis. So chemiosynthesis is similar to photosynthesis, except it occurs without any light. So the process is a little bit different, but the basis is to make those carbohydrates that form the bottom of the food chain. This picture here, so I have glucose entering into process A, and I'm producing ATP and CO2, and this is occurring inside of a animal cell. So this would be aerobic respiration. In the next picture, carbon dioxide enters process B, and I make glucose, and that is a plant cell, so that is photosynthesis. The next picture shows an arm muscle, and we see that glucose is going into process C, and we're making lactic acid, so that would be anaerobic respiration. This is something that can lead to muscle cramps if you have a buildup of lactic acid because your muscle cells are starved of oxygen. So anaerobic respiration is extracting energy from glucose without the presence of oxygen. It's not as efficient, but if the cell is really desperate for energy, it can get in enough energy for it to survive, at least in the short term. Fermentation, that is anaerobic respiration. Uh, a decrease in CO2 would directly slow this process down, so that would be photosynthesis. Eventually, it would slow down respiration as well because there'd be fewer sugars available, but the most direct process that is affected would be photosynthesis. Requires light, that would be photosynthesis. Produces food using energy from inorganic compounds is chemiosynthesis. So instead of getting that energy from the sun, Chemiosynthetic organisms have to extract energy from inorganic compounds. Key organelle is mitochondria, so this would be aerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration occurs completely in the cytosol, so there's no mitochondria involved. 
explain how the chemical equation for photosynthesis and cellular respiration are related to each other. So there is photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide and water make glucose and oxygen. And we see that cellular respiration is the complete opposite of that. So in this picture, this is showing us an example of a carbon cycle. So we can see that cellular respiration is occurring from the bunny, the animal, is undergoing cellular respiration, and it exhales carbon dioxide. This also occurs if that organism dies and then is broken down by decomposers. These are all producing carbon dioxide. We also, through combustion of fuels, we also produce carbon dioxide. The chemical equation for combustion is the exact same equation, almost, as it is for photosynthesis. And we see this part of the process that regenerates sugars. That would be photosynthesis. So these processes are opposite of each other. They depend on each other in order to occur. Next one, how could you measure the rate of photosynthesis in the picture below? So you can count the number of oxygen bubbles given off by the plant. So for example, if you wanted to see how temperature affects rate of photosynthesis, you can put the plants in different temperatures and then count the bubbles given off. So you could have a plant in cold temperatures and count the bubbles, warm temperature, count the bubbles, and then room temperature and count the bubbles. What happens when a phosphate group is removed from ATP? So a substantial amount of energy is going to be released. So this is a hydrolysis reaction. We start with adenosine triphosphate, ATP. We lose a phosphate. Now we have adenosine diphosphate. So tri means three, di means two. We also have that one inorganic phosphate by itself, and we produce lots of energy. We can then, if we're a plant, we can regenerate this ATP from sunlight or uh, store it in the form of sugar. Explain why two ATP are required at the start of cellular respiration, at the start of glycolysis. So glycolysis requires ATP energy in order to activate the reaction. So in this reaction, we see that glucose needs two ATP in order to make pyruvic acid. At this point, the pyruvic acid would then enter the mitochondria and continue on with cellular respiration. We also make four ATP. So overall, we make a net of two ATP that are generated from glycolysis. How does carbon dioxide provide chemical energy for an ecosystem? So carbon dioxide provides the carbon used by plants to make sugars. In turn, these sugars provide energy in the form of food to animals. And then animals that eat the animals get that energy. So here we see a glucose molecule. And you can clearly see that the molecule is made up of carbons. So the source of this carbon in this glucose molecule is from uh, carbon dioxide. So that is the end. Again, you can find this review and this video at srhsbio.wikispaces.com.